Um, he specialized in technology and data politics. So today, uh, Michiel will focus on talking about Siri. Siri is uh, a famous case of citizen risk scoring to detect uh, welfare fraud, uh, which was declared illegal this year by the Dutch court. And uh, we are very much looking forward to hear about his presentation later. Uh, Julian Hauser is our second guest and second speaker. He's a PhD student of mind and cognitive science at the University of Edinburgh. His research focuses on the self and how it is changed by modern digital technologies. And uh, Julian will today uh, will talk about the ethics of artificial intelligence, more, more or less. Um, so, but before we start with uh, presentations and with uh, talks, um, like each speaker will have around like 15 to 20, 20 minutes. Um, and uh, then after each speech, we will have a, a Q&A and uh, you can already type also your questions into the, the Zoom chat. Uh, we will follow that as well as uh, write your comments on, on Facebook. Um, so we, before we start with the presentation of, of Michi, um, I have some questions for you uh, as uh, the audience, as we would like to know um, where you are from or where you're based at the moment. So we would like to invite you, Masha, can you please uh, share your screen? Uh, we would like to invite you um, to go on Slido, slide.do. Uh, uh, and uh, to type in the number that you now will see, and then you can uh, participate exactly. So go to slider.com and then type in the number. And then we we'll hopefully see, get answers for the first question. Don't be shy. We won't track you. Nice, welcome. Many beautiful cities. More Belgrade. So the whole city and office is joining. That's very nice. Are there more participants or? Are we like a cozy uh, little group of people? I mean, you can also uh, later on watch this on our YouTube channel. So, um, oh, Minsk as well, nice. Um, cool. So I'm very happy that you are here. And maybe we can go now to the second question. I hope nobody, I missed nobody, but... Uh, Maybe other people join later, so uh, don't worry. Uh, so the second question uh, is, um, how much do you know about citizen scoring? So do you feel already as an expert or are you like a beginner? Okay, so for many people, it's um, it's quite new, but I mean, that's good because like we're here today in order to learn more about it and also to see some very nice, interesting examples of it. So, uh, and the last question would be, uh, what is the first thing that comes up to your mind when you hear citizen scoring? What is, tri what is it triggering in your mind?
you can also put several um, several things if you have several things in, in your mind. Brave new world, that's interesting. Cool. I mean, uh, we can leave it for a moment. Um, I will uh, now uh, like shortly define citizen scoring. Citizen scoring, um, I think, Masha, you can keep it running. Um, maybe it's still changing a bit, um, So, but it will fit to what I'm saying now. So, so very short version of citizen scoring is like we understand by the term citizen scoring processes uh, that are described where decisions are made by or with the support of algorithms. So there are more complex definitions, but I think we can work with this today. And um, I'm very happy that somebody wrote China as uh, citizen scoring is something we actually usually connect, firstly connect with China and their social credit system. In, this, in these systems, algorithms decide, for instance, if you, if you get state benefits or if you are allowed to travel abroad. So, well, this is of course not how the technology is used in Europe, um, but uh, there are some uh, EU governments that are already using automated decision-making. Automated decision-making is another word for citizen scoring. It's more like used by uh, in the tech community and probably it's a bit more precise. So, and these systems are, are used to, by the governments to score citizens and to detect, for instance, children who are in danger of neglect or to determine how much care elderly or disabled people should get or to spot uh, or to spot welfare fraud. And about the, this example of welfare fraud we'll uh, now hear in Michel's presentation. And um, now I would like to give the floor to you and to share your thoughts and your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Bianca. I will um, start sharing my screen as well. And I think you should be able to see my screen at the moment. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, okay, perfect. Well, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the political grip and control over AI and then uh, specify to the topic of, uh, of Siri. Um, first, a short introduction. I already have been introduced. So uh, you can see it here in the, in the first five bullet points. Um, I try to uh, be an agenda setter and influencer in the debate around technology politics because uh, my experience so far in the Senate and in the provincial parliament is that the focus is not there yet. There's um, the expertise is not there yet. And uh, the, um, the technological revolution is going faster and faster. So I have done that personally by amending um, um, in our data vision in the provincial parliament because it was a very mediocre piece. Um, Recently, we have formed the AI working group in the Senate to look at specific laws and if they are still uh, usable for the, for the developments that are here now and that are coming in the future. And like questions like, do we maybe need more fundamental rights? Like one of the, one of the rights uh, that people are thinking about in the Netherlands is the right of physical contact with uh, with people. Like you have to, uh, people are thinking about having robots in uh, in the care of for for elderly. Well, should it be a right to uh, to have physical contact with a person? Yes or no? Those kind of questions you can think about. And we have also uh, have had two conferences in the Senate about uh, together with our scientific bureau of the Green Left, uh, the Helling, and about if technology can be leftish. So that's a short introduction. Um, I want to start with three examples of predictive AI in the Netherlands. Uh, the first uh, is a relatively positive and new uh, example, and that's about a debt alert. And uh, this is an example not to find people um, to make sure that they are paying their debts, but it's, it's an AI system of the... Of the um, of the part of the government that is uh, collecting fines and they are using it to help 
uh, citizen in like alerting like if people have problems with paying their bills like say for example there's a person who has a lot of who has gotten a lot of fines in the past and was always on time with paying those fines and all of a sudden he is not or she, he or she is not paying it or paying it too late where the, the fine will be higher so they can actually see that people might have uh, problems with uh, with uh, with paying his uh, his bills, and then they can be a bit more softer. Um, another uh, another another um, AI predictive AI that's being used is predictive policing by the by the national police in uh, in the Netherlands, and they are actually focusing on certain neighborhoods where they are trying with with certain data to to predict where crime will um, will occur. Um, that made me think maybe you are you are known with the compass uh, system in the USA. Uh, this was inherently discriminat discriminatory, and what it did it was helping judges to estimate how big the chance is that people gonna gonna commit crimes again. And due to the data that was being put into the system is that especially black people and Afro-American people, um, because they were, um, they were um, how can I say it in English? They were uh, overrepresented in the, in the, in the data of, of crimes and also of, of committing crimes again. That system automatically gave uh, Afro-Americans a higher score on the risk of committing crimes again. Um, this system is not in use anymore, but it has been in use for years. Um, and then the third, which I will talk more broadly about, about is a Dutch system. I have translated a bit. It's, it's called System Risk, risk Risico and uh, uh, Indication. So they're trying to uh, estimate, uh, to flag people, whether how the probability chance of people committing uh, social uh, fraud. I will talk about it a bit more uh, later on, but first I want to have a more general start of the of the topic. And the first question I think we always have to ask ourselves is how well does the AI work? And um, in the Netherlands, it's like the, the, the established self algorithms perform statistical calculations, as we all know. I hope, and they have always a margin of error. And um, the rule of thumb, which I always uh, focus on, is that, say, for observations, um, say, for AI observations focusing on, like, say, facial recognition, the margin is often relatively small. But the, the margin in future prediction is often much, much larger. So you can also see how successful China is in like face recognition, all their, all their citizens, that's relatively uh, accurate, but on the future predictions, um, the margin is, uh, is quite big. Um, the questions we are um, focusing on is how to keep grip on the algorithms and AI. And we do that from a certain uh, point of view. In the European Union, we also have, of course, the, uh, the legal uh, framework of the GDPR. It's, it's now put on the AVG, that's like the Dutch, uh, the Dutch uh, briefing. And um, we, we focus on liability law, fundamental rights, um, and those can provide a scope for addressing those issues. Um, and the things you have to think about is people normally think about privacy, but it's much, much broader than it is. So you can see you have to think, think about human intervention so that there's always there should be a person who has like a final check on what is being decided by an, uh, by an algorithm uh, like this week. We had a we had a in the AI working group. There was a senator of the Liberal Party, and and the, and she said like, why should you have a human intervention? It's like people make mistakes as well. And then the expert gave uh, as an as an answer to it: if we uh, publish new games these days, then uh, there are always bugs in these games. And then like the game developers these day, they put out a beta ver version and they ask the people to show where all the bugs are. I think that's a quite of a simple example to, to see how still the human intervention can still be of value. Um, 
Yeah, you see some other things like explainability, accountability, discrimination. I talked about that uh, just before on the Compass uh, example. Uh, always very focused on the, the role of private parties who, of course, have very much interest in the data, which, in my point of view, should be a common good uh, if the data is from the citizens. Um, the security, of course, because it's always very, um, very fragile, the systems. Uh, legal protection of citizens supervision on the on the systems uh, we have like an authority board in in the netherlands but it's not well equipped like resource wise and of course we need a good fundamental democratic control and therefore politicians also need to be able to understand it to control it so these are like more of the the fundamentals uh, we uh, we focus on if we talk uh, about uh, about ai and if we assess uh, law in uh, in the province in the province and in the in the senate go to the next uh, sheets i put down some questions for you to think about what kind of questions we can ask if like new developments arise and I think one of the crucial questions is, is it, has it been proven that it works? Because many times we have new systems and we think, okay, let's try it, but we don't know if it works. And then if it works, does the infringement of rights outweigh the benefits? And that's of course also a political question. And therefore it's also good to find some sort of independent uh, judgment for those uh, infringe, infringements and therefore of course um, the fundamental rights can be a good uh, good guiding um, is there a better alternative do we dare to say no like in my point of view we should not have face recognition in the audience area um, contrary to china i just saw it also in the in the in the q a uh, um, the, are the principles, the values and the rights observed from a citizen point of view? I will come to that later, but I think that's very crucial that we, the, the technologies we allow, that they serve the people and not per se the state. And then which legal principles should be refined? I just gave a small example of the care for elderly, and, uh, but depending on what kind of system you have, those are, that is also from a legal perspective, a very, uh, very important question. And of course, the liability, if something goes wrong, who is, uh, who is responsible? Is it the developer? Is it the one who owns the system? Is it the one who bought the system? Those kind of questions are very, uh, very relevant. You have, of course, uh, maybe the, the, the more, most clear example is maybe the Tesla car. If it, uh, if it runs over a, of an automatic car, not a Tesla car, but an automatic driving car, if it runs over somebody who is liable. So then more of a more of a zoom in in the in the system risk, uh, risk and uh, indication. Um, for me, this is about being like Dutch citizens were suspect without probable cause. And I think the first sentence of the I will read it out loud because I think that says it all. So without knowing Citizens are flagged in high-risk data banks for two years for maybe, maybe not complying social and labor law based on a broad and vague purpose definition to prevent misuse of social benefits, income, and labor-related schemes and tax fraud. That was the ID. And um, five public authorities, you can see them, the tax, the unemployment, the social security, the labor inspections and the immigration and naturalization service, local municipalities, they all gave a total of 17 different data sets. I will show you later on what, what kind of data sets they used. And, um, and, it, and it has been come on the, to fierce criticism in, uh, in the Netherlands and um, journalists, NGOs, they have formed a pack to also to start a case against it. And they wanted to know exactly what was going on in the, in the Siri, uh, Siri system, like which data, um, what combinations are made when you are being red flagged, what defines somebody as a risk. And um, all, these, all these important questions were not answered by the Dutch government because of confidential, confidentiality uh, to prevent anticipation of fraudster. That was the, 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 literally the words of the government and calculations of, uh, of behavior. And um, this is quite sad, but Siri was adopted without a debate or a vote on the issue. 
and um, it was a bit put away in a law and people weren't focused on it but it shows so it illustrates so perfectly that legislators politicians they have a limited knowledge on the topic and if they have a bit of a topic it's still very hard to see within laws where they put it that was with siri was the, was the case so also because of that there was a big um yeah big public uh, criticism on the siri when it came into the media um and thanks to the media attention it also got gotten clear what kind of data was being used you can see i i, I labeled it all it's like labor text straight right? there was so much data being put in in the algorithm and like weight like how how much is one data being more important than the other data all those all that kind of information was not clear for the for the politicians for not for the for the journalists and uh, only for the people who had um, who, who yeah who were uh, who were pushing the buttons of the of the siri uh, siri system and um and what uh, what happened exactly like they were able to uh, on every citizen in a specific postal area code to put down um, the system and to check whether there was um, there was misbehavior and so entire neighborhoods at the same time were exempt like fishing nets and so the multiple risk indicators they designated red flags to certain addresses that might uh, commit fraud and um, they were all all the laws and misconduct were named in the Siri let, uh, law text, and they were all used. So all the laws that were uh, they were uh, allowed to be used by uh, by the government, they were used. And then what I said before, there was public outrage about it, and then a broad coalition of uh, of journalists and NGOs they uh, they started uh, they sued the state for uh, to stop with Siri, and. Um, and based uh, on the on the 17 categories of the personal data uh, that it was a black box that there was no transparency and it was based on a receipt of distrust towards citizens who were not suspected of anything and that's crucial of course and um, so the government said no 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 it's all fine and uh, this is within uh, within the law it was approved by uh, by government of by the by the vote of the parliaments and um, but in our point of view, and also in the point of view of uh, Maxime Februari, also spoke at our conferences we held. She said, so he said, uh, it was a fundamentally problematic because if you're no longer assessed on the basic of a violation on a known norm, but based on secret risk profiles, the fear of repercussions is present in every contact with government. And then the mistrust of government will grow among citizens and that's of course not uh, not opportune uh, people and there was like um with in 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 rotterdam uh, citizens after media attention knew they were uh, under uh, under investigation by this system and one of the general feeling people had is that they were they were uh, treated like criminals and um because of the media attention it also came out like how effective is this system i would i want you to remind me of the of the question i asked before like does it work well not one single fraudster has been caught through because of this system so only based on that question the system should never have been uh, implemented um, also the united nations uh, the special rapporteur condemned uh, siri in a letter to the court and um and uh, oh, she called it uh, like a digital equivalent of an inspector knocking on every door. So the courts ruled that uh, this, the Syria legislation declared was non-binding and in breach with the European Convention of the Human Rights victory on the most important and fundamental points, transparency, variability and data mineralization. So then Syria was stopped uh, without having yeah, caught one fraud. So. so that's a good or a bad thing, and I don't know, it depends on the point of view you're looking at it. So from this, there should be uh, four, four takeaways, not five. Um, Siri has been insufficiently, in, uh, insufficiently transparent and variable. 
Citizens therefore cannot defend themselves against the data analysis carried out and based on the fundamentals of privacy and data law, uh, data protection uh, law, it was not in line with it. And uh, instruments like Siri can have a chilling effect on the willingness to share information and also what I said before on the relationship with, uh, with the government. Well, to go slowly to, uh, to, uh, to a conclusion here, if you now think about the Siri example and you think about privacy, human intervention of controlling it, explainability, which wasn't there, accountability, discrimination. Well, if you think about that certain uh, areas, certain neighborhoods were specifically targeted, they were mainly low income uh, neighborhoods who had social benefits. So the more richer parts were not under investigations because there was way less data about those people. So, and if you think about the Compass example of America, um, if your data is being filled with certain neighborhoods of people who might commit fraud in low income neighborhoods, then the future data will be filled with even more data of people from low income neighborhoods committing fraud if the system would have worked. And so you come in this spiral of data on a certain group, um, just like what happened with the Afro-Americans in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. Well, the legal protection of citizens was, was not okay. Uh, the supervision was not okay. And the democratic control, especially not from the parliaments who adopted the law without even voting for it, which was just a hammer piece, was also in, uh, insufficient. So, but this is my last sheet. And this is quite of a sad sheet, but uh, I will try to end with a positive note. The super series is already on its way in the Netherlands. And this word has been... Um, put on a new law by the same people who started the law of uh, started the case uh, this the, the case against the dutch government because there's like a, there's a law the data processing by partnerships act in dutch the, the wgs by the dutch government is a bill and this is a quote from the government is to improve the exchange and processing of data between bodies that cooperate with each other in tackling for example so far it's all siri the fight against undermining crime, disruption of public order and security, or misuse of public money and social provisions. So only the fact that they put in undermining crime and, and disruption of public order and security, this is also the same basis as of what Siri was, uh, was based uh, upon. And both the Dutch Data Protection Authority and the Council of State stated that no uncertain terms that the, that the WGS seriously undermines the legal protections of citizens and that every Siri in the form of a system then needs a separate law. And in the Netherlands, it works like that, that first you have a, like a template of the law and then the Council of State gives an advice and the government has asked advice from the Dutch Data Protection Authority. But after that, the, the government changed the law and they added four extra series a public private series to the law and is now so far refusing to send the adjusted law back to the council of state in my point of view a law that could be the start of a massive data abuse privacy violation and human rights violations the second chamber of the netherlands who adopts the law first still has to uh, has to uh, start a debate about it and there will be a debate this time and I will guarantee you one thing, that this time it won't pass the first chamber without a debate. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was super, super interesting. Maybe um, just a few questions before uh, we start uh, with, Julian, uh, with Julian's presentation. Um, so how long was uh, Siri actually in place? It was for several years. It uh, the law was adopted in 2013, and the, the the government was sued in 2018. But it took a while before the system was actually up and running, and uh, it had it hasn't been used in the in the total of the Netherlands. But they used specific uh, municipalities, and uh, it was about uh, I know it it has it has been used in in several cities. Yes, for several years. 
Okay, that's, I mean, for not having a single, like, not catching a, a single person who committed a crime, it's quite a long time, right? Yeah. Um, so the system was not, uh, was not working, if you can say, the yeah, goal of the sure. system was not working, yes. Maybe one, um, I don't know if we have questions from the audience already, but otherwise I would uh, ask uh, another question. I found it uh, super interesting um, when you said that, uh, like with the comparison to video games, that if you're like uh, gamers are publishing video games in a better version, like, do you think it would be uh, also a possibility or like, a future for uh, like these uh, kind of systems, automated decision making systems in, in better versions where people actually could enter and then find bugs. But I mean, like, how can they find bugs if it's if they don't even know like how it works? So probably that's yeah. a conflict, right? Yeah, yeah, I understand your question. Um, yeah, I think uh, what I said before, I think you should always try to invent systems that work for the people. So making systems that are based on say predictive policing to find criminals to find fraudster you can actually have a debate about if you really want to adopt those kind of systems and then if you adopt those kind of systems then there should always be a very strong independent body that can take this wall up of checking the the beta versions but if you look at the at the uh, at the ethical points i put down it it should match accountability it should match human intervention it should match all so if you would have put siri against the line of all these uh, fundamentals then siri would have never been put in place in the way it has been put in place so that's why it's from a political point of view it's so important that in before you start implementing and inventing these systems you should have like a checkbox like, does it meet need, meet need the requirements that we have from a from a political point of uh, view on it? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's super important. I do. I mean, you talked about the working group on AI that you established. Are you or do you know of cases where like where there's there are already these check boxes are implemented or like what do you say is uh, like the state and politics? discussing about AI? Well, there are, um, we, uh, from the, from the Green Left Party, I, uh, I work together with, uh, with one of the, one of the senators who have, uh, uh, like, um, like put forward a certain, uh, um, a certain paper, and it was adopted unanimously by, uh, by the Commission of uh, Judicial Affairs. And like, if you see the, the points uh, of the fundamentals that you see there, we, those are those will be the focus points of the AI working group, and um, to check ac actually uh, if the law that we are uh, that we have now, if they are still appropriate for the systems that are coming. So it's like made from a point of view that from a lawmaking perspective, like if we maybe need adjustments of privacy law of, of those kinds of things to have a better controlling function on say future series. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I will give the word now to Julian um, and then afterwards uh, we'll continue with the discussion and uh, as I said, uh, please write your questions into the chat. Unfortunately, uh, there are not so many questions yet, but uh, continue asking all kinds of questions and um, then we'll try to answer them afterwards. So Julian, the floor is yours. Uh -huh. Can you hear me now? Does it work? Yes, excellent. And um, also, I'm in Pakistan, so my internet is pretty flaky. So if I drop off, just write me in the chat so I know that I don't talk to it like no one. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Julian. I'm usually a PhD student in philosophy in Edinburgh, but currently I'm in Pakistan finishing up. It's the last month of uh, my PhD. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, I work on uh, things connected to modern information technology and uh, with yeah, ethics of AI. 
um, in philosophy of mind and cognitive science. And also, I um, so what I want to talk about today is really just a very quick sort of overview of some of the topics that I think are important in, in, in the area of ethics of AI. It's really going to be a very quick sort of run over many, many topics. Um, but I hope you'll get a sort of rough overview of some of the topics. And um, so, yeah, the first part I'm going to talk about some general issues in AI and what it is. Then I'm going to quickly talk about a few examples of where AI is used in the public sector rather than the private sector. We've already heard uh, plenty of uh, interesting examples in the, in the last um, presentation. Um, and then I'm going to focus, and that's going to be the biggest part, uh, on four areas that I find especially problematic um, in that field. So, okay, AI. Um, I think there's generally two very different um, questions that are, or topics that are talked about as AI. And one is sort of specialized AI, that is the mostly machine learning systems that we know today that are used for all sorts of things like what we just heard and some of examples that I will give. But these are quite, um, you know, not very intelligent systems really. They are good at doing one specific thing and that is recognizing patterns that they have learned to recognize from massive uh, amounts of data. And they, you know, they specialize. So they, they, they know how to, I don't know, identify traffic lights or um, welfare fraudsters or, you know, these sorts of things. I mean, apparently they're not even very good at these things. Uh, um, but that's one thing. And then you have the other thing, which is general artificial intelligence. And that's the idea that there might be an artificial intelligence that is sort of, you know, human level intelligent or, or even more so. Um, and that, and these two topics bring up very different um, ethical questions. And obviously, maybe for us currently more relevant are the specialized AI systems because they actually exist. But in the long term, um, general AI questions are also very important. Um, okay, so here I'm going to talk mostly about um, specialized AI. Um, right now, I'm just going to make a few comments about general AI because it is interesting. So if that happens, or if, if, if we, you know, create artificial intelligence systems that are as smart as we are, or even smarter, then we have to start thinking about things that are very unlike our current sort of worries. So we might have to think about um, robot rights. So do, are, are these sort of systems persons? Um, are we allowed to make them work for us? Would, would that be something like slavery? Um, is it a good thing to have relationships with them? So there's all sorts of different questions that come up then, which are very far removed from sort of the current ethical um, questions that I'm going to focus on now. All right, so we'll go now to the second point, um, where I just want to quickly highlight some of the areas where AI is currently used in the public sector. Um, obviously, this depends on the countries. Um, um, the US is, is currently the most sort of innovative, not necessarily in a good way, um, country in this regard. Um, but as you have heard uh, in the EU and European countries, uh, many of these things are uh, happening too. China, of course, but also many other countries. It really depends. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got a few areas here where AIs are used. So one thing, for example, is um, in sort of public benefit um, human resources areas where, for example, an AI might be used to identify which children are at risk and you know, send care workers there to investigate. Um, there might be AI systems that um, look um, which homeless people should have priority housing and which not. Um, or in the US, there's some AI systems that decide uh, yeah, who, who has access to certain healthcare and, and who doesn't. Uh, and, and where, for example, also is it um, uh, where, where are the risks of fraud? Um, yeah, public health is a big topic. Um, obviously, one of the uh, areas is identification of diseases. I think there was very recent where some AI was 
and humans are dying from cancer. Um, they are kind of good at disease. Um, they are also used interested to identify where um, doctors might be giving out too many uh, prescription drugs. So in the US, for example, where there's uh, big issues with well, op opioid uh, misuse, uh, such systems can be used to monitor which doctors uh, give out how much drugs and, and then uh, see where there might be uh, uh, investigation required. And then a big, big sector is criminal justice. Um, I mean, we have surveillance where, you know, face detections, license plate recognition and so on. We have predictive policing, as was mentioned already, where the system um, can identify, for example, which neighborhoods should be um, policed more, uh, which uh, people are higher risk and so on. Um, as also was mentioned, uh, uh, systems like Compass that are used uh, by the uh, criminal justice system. Um, such systems are used for various things. One is um, assessment of whether the, a person in this justice system is likely to get rearrested, whether they are likely going to run away if on bail, uh, these sort of things. Um, also, systems are used to try to identify high risk people so that only high risk people are imprisoned and, and low risk people are left free so that the prison system doesn't um, get overburdened. Um, and finally, also systems that uh, decide on who should be get, uh, get on parole and who shouldn't. I mean, obviously these kind of systems have a massive impact on, on, on individual people's lives. Um, and the final area I wanna highlight is in education. Systems are used in, uh, to evaluate teachers uh, to decide uh, who goes to which school uh, and to identify which students might be at risk of being violent. Um, so as you can see, there's a whole range of areas where it's used. And that is just the sort of public government sector. So in the private sector, they are used even more. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the private sector now. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about a few um, sort of areas uh, of um, where I think big ethical questions are. I don't, it's this, I, I don't have answers for the most part. I'm just <laughs> going to throw a bunch of uh, difficult questions out there. Um, many of them have actually been touched on already before in the last presentation. Um, so one thing that was mentioned, for example, is that AI is often a, a black box of sorts. And that is not just because people don't have the right to um, see how these systems work, which is often a problem, but also that systems work inherently in ways that we humans don't quite understand. So when we train such, a, so these systems, they work so that you have, you have a certain algorithm that you then train with a lot of data. And this algorithm then calculates probabilities um, that it uses to then identify these patterns. We don't quite understand how all these million of factors come together in a decision. It's like, you know, opening up a brain and being like, oh, why did I decide to, you know, have a glass of water now? It is really hard to see, to reconstruct from looking at the brain why this happened. And this is the case with many um, AI systems. They are often like black boxes, even for those who, you know, make them. Um, well, another thing is that often, they're invisible. So it's not just that we don't know what works in them. We don't know how the decisions are made, but it's also that we don't even know that decisions are made. So for example, the system as theory that was mentioned before, many people might not know that it exists. So they might not know that, you know, they're being investigated by that system. So decisions might, might be made for people who have no idea that uh, some AI system is making decisions that affect their lives. And finally, in this sort of area of issues related to a lack of knowledge or understanding, there's the problem also mentioned before that the people who legislate and make decisions at the political level often are the people who, who really understand how AI work. And the, the issues are to some extent very technical and it's hard to understand how they work. And 
And obviously that's, I mean, one question is, is the legislator, but obviously the other question is the people who are affected by it uh, also don't really know how they work. And so, yeah, that is always a, always a, a, a problem, for example, when it comes to questions of trust and so on. Um, so I think this is yeah one area of ethical issues which are connected to sort of lack of knowledge of, of various sorts with regards to those uh, these new technologies. Um, a second area that I want to focus on is um, how uh, AI reinforces quality and then it has already. Um, Julia, now you're gone. Like you have on. Now you're back. I'm gone. You were gone oh, no. for uh, like maybe okay. thirty <laughs> seconds or something. Sorry. So maybe you could just repeat your like oh, your oops. last sentence. But just repeat your All last right. sentence so was, where you were. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, the new point I'm talking about is about inequality. Um, and point I was gonna mention there is. Uh, bias rate often well bias always as biased as the data is that it is built on well at least as biased as, as the data and the data is usually decisions and these decisions can then lead to more data which is also biased and as mentioned before this can lead to a sort of vicious circle um yeah. Um, also, when it comes to job automation, so obviously uh, doing certain, I mean, the, the risk is that those people who are most at risk of losing jobs because of AI are those people who already now work uh, for the lowest. I'm going to switch off my camera just and hope that it works better. Goodbye. Um, so yeah, the people who are most at risk of losing their jobs are the people who uh, already have the lowest paying jobs. Um, obviously, that is just going to further reinforce inequality. And, and, you know, people with, you know, college degrees and so on, people who, who for example, <laughs> program the AIs, they, are, they have very good salaries. And, and so in that way, it will further increase sort of the white cost color versus blue color division. Um, and finally, um, AI also leads to centralization of, of sort of the technology, so often does, because today's AI is built on these massive data sets and only very few organizations and companies have these data sets. So it's pretty much, you know, the Facebooks, Googles, Amazons and, and Tencents and so on of today that have the ability to, you know, develop these systems. It's not even the algorithms. The algorithms everyone has, they're public, why it's the data sets, which are controlled by these companies that have loads of data which they get from us and then use the AI to get even more data. And so again, you have a sort of reinforcing circle. And that makes it difficult because AI, I mean, it has obviously very interesting and uh, applications as well, but it's not really, it's not really something that most of us can do or even that, you know, technically adept of us can do. Um, so that was issues with inequality. Um, now I want to talk about issues to do with responsibility and autonomy. Um, also has been mentioned already, for example, with uh, self-driving cars. Um, but it's in general, I mean, in general, often these systems make decisions for us. So for example, a self-driving car will uh, be driving for us and will decide where to go. And there's very interesting issues there, for example, related to um, how these cars should be programmed to react in a case of an accident. Should they sacrifice the driver if thereby the car can save, say, two other people? And that, I mean, that's, that's one question. It's a difficult question, but it's, even a more, it's an even more difficult question, I think, to ask whether um, we should be allowed to tinker, to change our car's programming because if, you know, if we want to ensure that the least people die, then we should be prohibited from changing our own car to not kill ourselves. So taking away a large 
degree of autonomy from ourselves and yeah we, we will have to decide one way or another what to do in, in such uh, cases um, another issue is responsibility so yeah who is responsible if something goes wrong as mentioned before all these systems have certain error margins so you know mistakes always do happen do we just say well that's you know how things are no one's really to blame or do we blame i don't know the person who programmed it the person who operated it the person politically responsible for you know instating the system there's many different people that could be you know blamed or held responsible and it's it's, it's not clear who it should be and the question becomes more difficult when the systems are more autonomous because the more autonomous the ai becomes the more you know the more it was the ai rather than any you know human being and i guess at the, at the sort of general ai sci-fi future end of the spectrum we then have to ask well when does the ai become responsible but i guess we are still very far away from there um and the last thing in that sort of category of responsibility responsibility and autonomy is something that i always yeah I'm very annoyed by is this sort of idea that oh we have these technological gadgets let's use them to solve our, all our problems and I, I, there's this temptation that everything can be solved by you know just programming the right sort of thing and often and often it's not true and often it leads to you know solutions that are not really solutions but just sort of fighting symptoms and yeah I think I think it often takes away from the our sort of convictions that we, you know, we can't do something to change these things rather than, you know, tell Silicon Valley to solve it for us, please. Um, the next problem I want to focus on, the last one, um, is how AI is more and more structuring human interactions. So, I mean, obvious, the, the, the sort of examples that everyone knows about are things like uh, how I don't know Facebook and Twitter feeds uh, are, are curated by AIs uh, or TikTok is very well known for being very um, AI focused in their approach of who gets to see what but I mean that's just one thing um, you also have AI moderating content so AI is used to find out um, I don't know for example whether there's hate speech in a chat or whether there's I don't know, fake news in a chat or whether there's anything or copyright infringement. Um, so AI has an increasing sort of importance in, in structuring these areas where, where people talk to each other and, and, you know, social and public sort of spaces. Um, and that's, I mean, that's hugely important for social personal reasons, but also for political reasons. Um, because obviously nowadays much political debate is happening online. And much of that debate is, is being structured more and more by these systems that you know suffer from all the other things that I've mentioned, um, biases and black box things, and us not being aware that it's even happening. Um, another thing there I just kind of realized in the last presentation is that uh, the example of the sort of deterioration of trust in the government is another way of how um, AI influences. Uh, our human relations or, or, or in that case the sort of citizen government relations um yeah something to think about um yeah i think that's that's about it i mean there's many other issues obviously but i'm just gonna uh, leave it here thank you very much thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and um yeah i think both presentations were really like really interesting and uh, i'm very happy that we uh, can go into a discussion now with you. Um, there were some questions in the chat I would like to address now. Uh, they were not directed to somebody specific, but uh, like before uh, Salih uh, was asking, like, or was contributing, he said like, well, um, I don't want to sound def uh, defensive, but I believe it's inevitable that we will have something like this quite common in the future, so these uh, these uh, systems of control, uh, isn't it better to argue, to argue how to have uh, one with our rights not to infringe and it won't be discriminatory? So this was uh, Salih's comment. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that or if uh, sure. I, I, yeah. can, I can answer the question. Sure. I think it's a fair question to ask. And I think I, I also try to highlight it um, before 
Um, but I'm not saying I'm against it all, but I think you have to ask some crucial questions before you start with it. And the first one, one has it been proven that it works? The second one, does the infringement of rights outweigh the benefits? Is there a better alternative? Do we dare to say no to certain things? And I tried, I gave the example of face recognitions. And then are the principal values and rights observed from a point of, from a citizen point of view? I think that's also a very important question. And if maybe some principles need to be re refined and who's responsible if it goes wrong. And I think if you can answer these questions uh, positively or thoroughly, then um, you can use certain AI system uh, to predict, to make, say, say, to make a neighborhood more safe. But I think you have to make sure that you're not discriminating, say, for example, low income households. And those are like, fun so from a fundamental rights perspective, you need to look at these uh, questions and you have to make sure that the technology works for the citizens and not per se for the people in power or the government. Julian, you also wanted to... Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah um... I totally agree with what was just said. I just want to add maybe a sort of a more maybe philosophical point that I think we shouldn't expect these systems to be able to you know make the moral decisions for us. Now, to some extent, they they can you know they can find out things that we could out and they can make decisions. But it's also proven to be really hard to sort of align decisions that these systems make with our values. This is a, a value alignment problem, it's called. It's a, it's a problem that has been much discussed in, in, in the literature. And it's basically the issue that it's very hard to tell an AI, to ensure that an AI does stuff in ways that you know, align with the values that we have. So the classic problem is you, know, you, know, you, you have an AI that when you tell it, don't let anyone come in the house. And then the AI, I don't know, doesn't let the repairman come in the house or, 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 or shoots. Is gone? Ah, oh, damn it. Okay. But <laughs> just repeat the last sentence and then we're good. We hear the till yeah, the repairman. Okay, yeah. Okay, so it's very hard to, um, to program a system so that it doesn't violate any of our values, especially because our values aren't really sort of numerically you can't sort of calculate okay we want justice we want fairness and and so we'll do you know a calculation and we add justice plus fairness this is not how ethics work it's not it's not numbers that can be added and have a result at least not in any sort of easy way or at least we haven't found out how to do it so we should also not expect that they can do necessarily all the things that we currently you know want or to ourselves or maybe want would want to have done or you know I think that's a very important point that to not to rely on or not to give all our problems away to the AI and say like, okay, please solve our problems. These there are. Um, and then you have to find a solution for yes or no. That's uh, of course not how it works. Um, so we'll continue with the question by uh, Mika. Mika asked like, uh, should that be uh, used? Should, uh, should these systems be used if most people don't understand how AI works? I mean, you kind of already talked about that, um, but maybe uh, somebody, some of you could could give a uh, answer to that. Go. Mm, I can, you go first. So I think, yeah, yeah I think it it depends. I, I don't think it's it's a requirement that people understand, you know, how AI works in order for us to use AI. It's the same. I would say, I don't know, just do a random analogy. It's not that you know we only allow doctors if everyone understands how medicine works. Um, so I think there's you know, AI systems that can be extremely beneficial and well, most of us don't understand them. There's lots of things that most of us don't understand and which can be very useful. So I think that is okay. But what is problematic is if there's no sort of way to verify in case of doubt or whatever. So these systems must be open in some ways. There must be some way of investigating what happens. Now, obviously only experts might be able to determine what happened um, but it's important that there is such a way and otherwise you you end up with issues of trust 
uh, and yeah, and accountability and so on. So I don't think people need to understand it, but there needs to be yeah, there needs to be certain verifiability. Shall I answer the question of Luca Gudek? Yeah, please. So Luca asks, uh, I will just read it out so everybody um, everybody knows the question. Uh, so Luca asks, uh, looking forward, what do you think what do you think are the most effective ways of ensuring democratic oversight of AI implementation? Can we ensure enough expertise in the parliaments and can legislative bodies be responsive enough to potential infringements of citizen rights? I think that's really, this question really nicely connects also to what we just uh, started discussing. But also, I think we're here also about talking about literacy of AI. So how much do we actually know or need to know or need to teach people of, uh, about AI? How much do also parliamentarians need to know? And yeah, Michael, please. Um, yeah. Share your thoughts. Yeah, I think I think it's a very good question um, because I think there's, there's you have this technical aspect of the 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 um, the design of the algorithm and the data that is being put in there. I don't think it is um, it is realistic that uh, the parliament will actually go through data sets or actually look at how at the architecture architecture of the algorithm but i think uh, from answering certain political question you can do it from more of an abstract point of view where you i think in the future we will need independent bodies who are ex who have an expertise in this field who can actually assess the data that goes into the algorithm and the way the algorithm is being developed and they can have they can like present the the, the politicians with a report if it is um, if it applies to certain um, say check boxes certain boundaries which like say the politicians have defined and so you can you can maybe see it as an extra report we all, as politicians we also get reports these days of financial analysis of the of the data protection authorities so we get all kinds of reports from bodies who are uh, helping politicians making a proper political assessment and i think at the moment and i can say it for the netherlands and also i think in the european union they have done it a bit better but we need to um, give those bodies enough resources that they can actually do a proper task um, in like advising and government and uh, politicians to make uh, to make that assessment so i think that's a good start like in our province i have tried it but i didn't get a majority for that amendment but to start like an ethical commission about the smartest neighborhood in Europe, where, where citizens give away all their data, even they have analysis of what goes through the toilet and they can know later on if they are sick or they have like in these days if they have Corona, but they give everything away and they made of this system that the more data you give away, the less rent you will pay in that specific neighborhood. Well, I think the fact that, that uh, projects like these were developed without the ethical commission shows that we have a long way to go. Julian, did you also wanted to add something on this question or otherwise uh, we'll go to the next question which was uh, directed uh, to you? Yeah, we can go to the next one. Okay, so um, there was a question by Richard to Julian. Um, so a good governance entails that governments uh, can explain its decisions and predictions. Jeff Charter for the Smart City say, truly smart algorithms must be able to explain in, un in understandable language how they have arrived at an outcome. Do you think this is feasible? Um, yeah, good question. <laughs> um, and a difficult question. So I mean, first of all, I think it's maybe uh, to expect a bit much that the algorithm itself is going to be able to explain uh, what, uh, why it has decided what it has decided. So maybe we or some experts need to do that. Um, so I think, I think it's not per se impossible to explain how these things work. Um, 
So I guess it, it probably it probably depends. But it probably depends first of all how these systems are made. And I, I mean I'm not an AI expert, um, but I know that there is some research on, on, on creating systems that are sort of um, less black boxy, so that you can kind of trace back uh, decisions to where they came from. Um, so maybe more research needs to be made in that regard. But I also think maybe it really depends on the sort of social institution that we built in order to explain what happens. I mean, I, I don't know, for example, if we think about the legal systems, many of these decisions are not, you know, immediately understand or easily understandable or easily, easy, easy explainable to, to people. But somehow, at least in, 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 at least we think that these systems can work in a way that you know people trust that decisions are made in, in the correct sort of ways and if, if you know they lose in court they generally will at some point accept that you know it's, it's been fair and 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 um and it's okay even if even if i lost the same in, in i don't know in democratic uh, elections so i think it depends and i think i think i think yes it's possible if done well um and if the right sort of institutions are, are exist. Thank you. Um, so Masha had also a question. Uh, it was about connected to the transport system. So she writes, uh, I'm a big transport enthusiast and car hater. How do you think we can use AI or maybe you know any examples to make the transport more people friendly? Yeah. Um. I can, I don't know, say a few things. Um, I mean, one thing, and you're not going to like this because it has to do with cars, is um, to use cars in, in, in smarter ways. So for example, there's many, I mean, there's some cases in which uh, using like, you know, buses or trams or trains is, is, is not the most efficient because maybe it's a tiny village with very few people. Uh, and in those cases, um, you know, driverless cabs, shared cabs could be a very useful thing. So, I mean, self-driving AI, will be able to, for example, make it much easier to share cars, have the cars be where the people need them so that people can share the cars, um, have the cars you know, recharge um, when they need electricity without the person having to go to the car charging station and so on. So I think there's, there's potential there to use cars as a sort of you know, last instance, um, uh, you know, one element in the overall public transport system. And I think AI can help there. Yeah, Michi, maybe to add uh, Julian's uh, answer to, um, to your question, uh, Masha. Um, I think also besides car, we can also do that, of course, with buses. And I know in, the, in my province, we call it mobility as a service, the mass project. And there is, if you, the, the idea will be, and we are voting on it tomorrow, is that with the, with the app, you can actually, a bit like how we put it in, uh, put information, put our location into Google Maps now, and we say, okay, let's direct me to there. It now gives us like um, different, different transportation options. And then this system is going to advise because of traffic jams all, of, all in our province, like which transport to take in what phase of your journey and um, one of the biggest problems now is the is um, the, the costs, and it's mainly because of the small uh, buses that are driving around, because not enough people are using the system, that the costs are too high for all the people being picked up. And in this bus, there's still a driver. But like, if we can go in the future to a system where you can, like, if you start from your house, you go from point A to B, then and you are like say being picked up from a certain point by a self-driving bus who gets information of people who also want to take that same bus around a certain time well i think there are possibilities with ai that we can like make those trips more efficient and also lowering costs if we don't uh, if we don't have to uh, put a, like a, a person in that uh, in that bus that maybe drives around with no people in it So um, if there are no more questions, I have I would have another uh, 
question. So when we're talking we were to, before both of you, you were talking about these vicious circles of uh, of having data and then more data and more data and more data. And uh, that's like the big tech companies uh, that they will dominate also the market. And that's actually the problem and that not the algorithms. Um, so from a societal perspective, do you have an idea how to break out of this vicious circle? Like, does it need to have a public de debate? I mean, I imagine like talking about algorithms, it's like as abstract as uh, talking about climate change. Nobody really uh, like uh, really like sees it now or like uh, so everything is like projected into the future. So how would you say like how to break out of this vicious circle and how could we get a public debate running on this topic? Julian, do you go first or shall I go first? Go ahead. Um, well, I think the um, from, from my political personal point of view, um, I think we should start seeing our uh, personal data as our own data. And I think practices that uh, say like the Facebook and the Googles of, these, uh, of this world these days, they are just taking all our data, selling that data and building their company around that data only by us, because we clicked a box. Yes, we accept the term, uh, the term and conditions. Yeah, that that's a model. I think we should, uh, as as the people, should turn around. The data is a common good, and I think that's where it all starts. People should be more aware of the value of their data, and like say, take an example of uh, like Facebook. Like we are Facebook ourselves. It's like. We, this this infrastructure what has been created and we are like in this I, I, I don't know the English word but if a fish swims in in this certain and he cannot go out anymore that's a bit how it feels like if you delete your Facebook then you also lose all these contacts of all your friends nationally and internationally we should be able say to to uh, make Facebook like to give us that data and also to have this interface that we still are able to communicate with all these people we have in our network and not be um, not be attached to a company like that. So it might sound a bit uh, anti-capitalistic, but I think um, data and uh, and the ICT infrastructure is a bit like water and uh, water and the pipes are it's running through it's common goods and we should take more power to the people for that and uh, and i think that that awareness hasn't been uh, hasn't been developed i think in broad areas of society we can see it today with uh, with the election in uh, in america and uh, so i think it's like we are we are we are very much behind and, uh, and I'm not very hopeful that we can turn around this system very easily. So uh, I am a bit, bit skeptical uh, uh, about that indeed, about uh, breaking the power of the big tech. Um, yeah, I totally, so I, I really liked your last point on uh, the fact that these, these, these spaces which are, you know, private platforms, they are our public spaces, or they should be, or they function as, or should function as our public uh, space. Uh, and yeah, we, we should be taking it back somehow now, how, I don't know. Um, but yeah, more to the question of how to kind of create a debate around it. And I think this, this problem is similar to the problem of like, you know, privacy online and, and, and digital rights and all these things, which, which are very invisible to most people uh, because the way it affects them is, is, yeah, people don't notice and to the, to the extent that they do notice, they mostly don't really care. Um, so I think, I mean, first of all, I think it has to be legislated. There's no point trying to wait for companies to, you know, nope. I don't know, <laughs> it's not gonna work. So it has to be legislated. There has to be strict guarantees of the rights that people have. And that's the only way that's going to work to the marketplace. People are not going to, you know, automatically flock to the private uh, platform because all of all, all these platform effects and network network effects. Um, 
but yeah, how to make it how to make it into a debate for people so that the legislative changes can happen? That's really difficult, and I think it has to happen somehow with I don't know making it more graspable. Like I don't know TV series on a topic, public interventions around it, stuff that shows how these you know things that are usually behind hidden in servers operate, because most people they don't see it, they don't know about it, and and Without that, it's really hard to motivate people to, to do anything about it. And I, I mean, that's even the case in, in countries, I don't know, European countries or Germany, where, which are probably the most aware in the world around these topics and, and, and other countries. I mean, it's, it's, it's just not the highest priority, which is also understandable, you know, if people have other, other things to worry about. But yeah I, think, yeah, I think it has to be made visible. Somehow it has to be made visible uh, the workings have to be shown. Maybe you know these things don't affect everyone, and usually it affects those people who, who are already disenfranchised. So maybe we need to find out a ways to to for, to enable them to tell their stories, rather than you know the person who says, "Well, I have nothing to lose; it doesn't affect me." You know, it might be true, but the issue isn't that. The issue is that it does affect lots of people, and we need to hear about these things. But yeah, I don't, I mean, this is all very vague. And I mean, I've kind of been active in this digital rights sphere for a while and it's, it's really hard. Yeah, may, may, maybe, yeah, because I, I, I kind of like your answer, Julian, but maybe to add it and to make it maybe more concrete, like if you say, say like I go to go to work tomorrow and I say, okay, let's try to break the, the power of Facebook. We have, as politicians, we have the ab ability to write a law and to say, data power to the people and that we just decide that we will take it from them then we come and that's from a political sign i study political science eventually politics comes down to territory and territory is being protected by the military so eventually it will come down to go to the office of facebook first maybe politely ask them to give it over and maybe compensate them. And then we will probably have a problem because their head office will be in America and they won't be. But then you, that, that's how, this, how the fight can start. And if you get majorities in parliaments who say till here and no further, because you are threatening our democracy, what we have seen with the election of Donald Trump four years ago and with the Brexit, um, Till here and no further and okay we can maybe compensate you and we can maybe make us some sort of public private company from it you can think of ideas just to say like you have become so important so vital for the way we live these days that we take over the power yeah people will quickly um say oh maybe you're, you're a communist or something but you know, I, I, I do believe in basics of capitalism, but in a strongly regulated form, because we have seen what it does to our planet if we have this neoliberalistic linear growth model. Um, and within this model, the tech companies have evolved and have given us all these new uh, technologies. But eventually, it's, it's the main developments have been funded by government say gps where like the entire google maps is running on it's a government it's a state development and it's and it's for a lot of like say the internet google and facebook didn't invent the internet they didn't invent gps they are they are they are extracting their business models and their money thanks to that thanks to what the governments and the states have developed so there are eventually concrete actions you can take, but it goes directly against the way we have formed our economic system these days. And I think things has to go even worse before, um, before people come to this realization how important their data is. And I think you see some sort of a, a race um, between these geopolitical actors of America, China, Europe, a bit, a bit, Russia, where they are trying to collect so much data about human behavior 
to be able to predict so efficiently, so perfectly what we do, what we want, who we are, that at some point there will be some sort of a some sort of a point that they will have gathered so much data about us that they will know us better than we know ourselves. Yuval Noah Harari writes this about about this in his book. And um, so it eventually it also comes down to to showing uh, showing uh, showing balls and 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 like yeah going uh, picking up the fight and uh, yeah. Picking up the fight, I think this is a really uh, nice closing word. I think, um, yeah, thank you so much uh, for both of your contributions and for your energy and for your ent enthusiasm that you're working on this topic and um, fighting for uh, um, fair, just uh, green uh, data policies. So um, thank you very much for your examples. And uh, I think also, and also for the discussion on the ethics of AI, I think it's really important that we get this, uh, as you said, more to a public discussion and uh, need more regulating bodies or actually people who are, who are advising uh, governments on this and who really like take care of how uh, this AI can be used in a, in a way that uh, citizens benefit from it and uh, not that they're not losing from it. So, um, and yeah, as you said, systems must be open. So um, I think um, we should all go out now, probably not now, but like uh, we should continue working on these topics and uh, yeah, fight for uh, power to the people, data that they, uh, that data is the data of the people and not of the big companies. So uh, yeah, thanks also to the audience. You were a beautiful audience, even though I didn't see you. But um, I hope uh, you also enjoyed this discussion. And uh, yeah, have a nice evening. Enjoy your time. Thank you. Bye bye. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.